So rarely do we abate the movements of the eternity clock that I often forget how astonishing the slow passage can be. Unlike many and most, and, come to think of it, all time machines of lesser metal, the eternity clock operates by means of chronospheric attunement, allowing us to move with the flow of the time stream along its natural course. The moment the clock was activated, the space about the hysteria, and by extension the sword of Damocles, began to glow with a sharp, golden iridescence, slowly but surely expanding and refracting, as if to echo the semblance of the swirling clouds and glacial vistas beneath us. Accompanying this luminous fantasia was an equally wondrous amalgamation of echoing harmonies. A seasoned chrononaut would identify this phenomena as the ephemeral reflection of the infinite parallel time-streams stemming from the point of our departure. The apparitions of every possible future built upon the tiniest of variants in occurrence, visible to us by undimensioned sight. The sun rose and set over millions of years as we passed. There are few spectacles in this reality as staggeringly wondrous but my attention was entirely concentrated on the task at hand. I had no means of gauging when the crucible would explode other than the escalating heat. The temperature was already nearing dangerous heights, and the four of us aboard the cannon were suffocating under the heat. Augustus nearly lost his balance, and would have fallen if Ilsa had not caught hold of his arm. It became very apparent to me that the danger surrounding us would prove fatal if we did not reach our destination soon. Either the crucible would detonate whilst we were still mid-passage, destroying us and hopelessly damaging the chronosphere, or we would overheat before reaching the end of our passage, unable to complete the task of removing the cannon. In an attempt to further assess the gravity of the situation, I peered over the side of the machine to be met with a sight that ultimately swayed my decision. The armored section of the cannon that housed the crucible was glowing white hot. We couldn't wait any longer. I waved to Lytton at the helm, giving him the signal to cut short our passage. He called down to Lily through the speaking tube, and she promptly powered down the eternity clock. In an instant, the echoing light subsided, and we emerged. I don't think I have ever shouted the word, now, with greater volume than I did. Oft and Augustus thrust the cables into the transmitter junctions, and the four of us leapt from the cannon's neck. It was twenty-five feet from the cannon to the hysteria's balloon, and its armored outer shell did not make for the happiest of landing conditions, but bruised and bewildered we made our way down the rope ladder to the deck. Lytton and Lily rushed to greet us, but our well-being was but our secondary concern. We stared, unblinking and breathless at the cannon, still hovering stationary where it remained for thirteen unbearable seconds. Then, in a moment of joint horror and relief, the whir of the propellers grew into a deafening buzz as the transmitter supercharged their rotation. With juggernaut momentum, the sword of Damocles shot like a rocket into the high ether, diminishing to the size of a speck to our sight. It must have risen to twelve kilometers before the crucible finally detonated. Even from such a distance, the explosion was immense to behold. It lit up the sky with a cataclysmic burst of blinding white light. Within seconds, the shockwave reached the hysteria, throwing us into a state of mild turbulence, but not enough to pull our gaze from the explosion. It is a source of great shame and disgust to me that I found the sight beautiful at the time. Withdrawing below deck to the eternity clock, I was alarmed to see that we had emerged far earlier than intended, having been encumbered by the relativity clamps. 
We had aimed for the year thirty million, but had fallen drastically short in the year six hundred thousand, one hundred and twenty, whence the earth was still very much inhabited. Concerned by what this shortcoming might cause, we decided to set about investigating the consequences. We did not bother returning to twenty nine ninety nine, but instead receded by two decades and set course for a warmer climate in which to conduct our research. I remained in the clock room, using the eternity clocks to trace the event progression, whilst Augustus and Lytton took to the library, searching through historic records, archaeological reports, and testimonies from veteran chrononauts and transtemporal watchers. Unhappy hour! The loathsome truth we discovered could not have been more horrifying. The contemporary chronicles of the decades following the cannon's destruction indicated a steady but drastic increase in etherspheric levels due to an unknown alteration in the structure of the ozone. The records of the next thousand years describe catastrophic electrical storms and hurricanes that arose as a result of the sun's brutal solar winds upon the defenseless planet. This pattern of disastrous ruin continued for two hundred millennia, during which time the earth was rendered treacherous and uninhabitable. After this time, the etherspheric levels had resumed their effective normalcy. However, two hundred thousand years of untempered solar onslaught had left the planet very much changed. By the year eight hundred thousand, the human race had devolved into two unfortunate subspecies. The descendants of those wealthy and resourceful enough to find or build protective shelter from the deadly conditions became a race of frail, simple, childlike beings called Eloi. After centuries of idle, sheltered existence, their capacity for intellectual thought had greatly deteriorated. The Eloi would live a banal life of ignorance on the Earth's surface, oblivious and carefree, like lambs, whilst the wolves lurked below the surface. Those who did not perish under the sun's fury retreated underground. The march of time would leave their skin devoid of melanin and unable to bear exposure to bright light. Their descendants would be called Morlocks, a race of subterranean troglodytes, industrious but savage, and predators of the defenseless Eloi. Thus the earth would be new made as a desolate wasteland of brutal, unrelenting entropy. Chrononauts and transtemporal historians will and have referred to this dystopian epoch as post earth. I had heard of it many times, and always thought of it as the unfortunate but inevitable fate of mankind's self-destructive ambition. I had never imagined that it had been wrought by a single event, nor that I could have caused it. Initially, I could not help but feel entirely responsible, as if I had been chief architect of this terrible apocalypse, and the future souls left defenseless and decrepit would curse the name of Edward von Arkham before their incineration. That reason absolved me of true intent and total fault did little to ease my guilt that even now weighs oppressively on my shoulders. But I would not bear it alone. Salazar, Vicky, Eisenfaust, their 
petty, meaningless war had not only defiled the thirtieth century, but spread to consume the far-flung future and condemn the world to savage hell. And most unforgivable of all, they had made me its blind executioner. Long had I been running from the War of the Princes, thinking it too frivolous a conflict to be worth my time. But I now saw what could befall from the unchecked quarrels of shallow monarchs. It was clear that this war must stop, and its orchestrators face justice. Lytton, Elsa, Augustus, Lily, and Oft all agreed that intervention was both necessary and right. And so we resolved to bring retribution to the warring crowns of Britain and Bavaria. Unaware of how far down the rabbit hole our quest would take us, and of the loathsome, eldritch horrors we would uncover. After our quest was complete, I resolved to repair to the best of my ability the damage done to the mercy-stricken post-Earth. Distraught to learn that his invention had been the cause of such a future, Nikola Tesla was avid to join in my effort. We enlisted the aid of good men and women, all brilliant and resourceful in their fields. Florence Nightingale, Randolph Carter, Mark Twain, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, and many others. Together with a team of chrononauts, we established a hold in this unforgiving dystopia, and began to rebuild civilization. We have called our effort the Atonement Project and work now to educate the Eloi, civilize the Morlocks, replenish and rejuvenate the ravaged planet, and build a foundation for a brighter dawn. My crew I have not included in the effort. It is not their burden to bear. Their guilt is mine, for I am entirely responsible for their involvement. It was never their war to begin with, and their wish to bring an end to it only stemmed from their loyalty to me and their steadfast sense of righteousness. Whilst their company in this broken world would allay my grief, this is something I must do alone. Of the countless times I have reflected upon the events of that day in Greenland, not once have I found the possibility of a more favorable outcome. Though this also does little to ease my guilt, I know that all that can be sought now is atonement, just as all that could be sought then was vengeance. <laughs>